Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jared Ball, Chief Economist of CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. Welcome to today's live stream, the 2022 federal election down to the wire. Uh, we're joined today by leading commentators for an insider's view of the campaigns and what to watch for as we approach election day. Can I begin acknowledging that today and every day we are on Aboriginal land, uh, committed to recognition and reconciliation. We respect elders and we support their stated aspirations. And I, for one, very much hope that we will see more progress on recognition and reconciliation in this next term of federal parliament. Today, as at all CEDAR events, you can interact through our Q&A portal, which is available via the link on your screen, uh, or you can enter the details by going to cedar.pigeonhole.at and using the passcode 2022 election. Uh, as I always say at these events, um, post early, post often, please vote on the questions of others. Um, we will absolutely be trying to get through as many questions uh, as we can in today's uh, session. Uh, you can also, in Pigeonhole, vote on a poll question today. Uh, and that poll question is, what is the most pressing issue uh, the next parliament will face? Uh, and I'll announce the results uh, of that at the end of the live stream. You can also, if you're feeling uh, brave, get onto Twitter. Uh, and use today's hashtag, which is hashtag Ozpol, uh, and tagging at uh, cedar underscore news. Um, and if you're good at your emojis, you can probably do uh, the kind of democracy sausage uh, symbol that I keep seeing uh, on Twitter these days. Of course, in 18 days, uh, Australians will be heading to the polls, and they'll be heading to the polls amidst an increasingly volatile global environment, growing inflationary pressures that are really biting uh, now at the household level, uh, and potentially uh, rising interest rates for the first time since 2010. And we might find out a little bit more about that later this afternoon. It's clear that whoever forms government at the federal election faces a range of critical choices. Uh, how do they pay for the services that the community values so much, like aged care, health and disability? Uh, how do they manage an economy that risks overheating in the short term, uh, but in contrast, risks running out of puff uh, in the longer term? Which levers do we pull in order to make housing more affordable? Uh, how do we ensure that we use a strong labour market to reduce disadvantage and get Australians into jobs? Uh, and of course, how do we sensibly accelerate and manage the path to net zero? So to discuss how these and many other issues are likely to play out in the remainder of the federal election campaign, uh, I'm joined by an excellent panel. Uh, Simon Banks, the Managing Director of Hawker Britain. Uh, Andrew Humpherson, CEO and Managing Director of Barton Deacon, uh, and Michelle Levine, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Roy Morgan Research. Um, so I am uh, looking very closely at uh, Pigeonhole to keep an eye on questions, but in the meantime, I am going to start with um, some, some questions for our panel. And I guess just, just kind of starting with a little bit of a state of play around where the electorate is at and, and where the candidates are at. Um, come to you first, Michelle, in terms of what your research is finding. Um, you know, what are the what where is the the electorate sitting in terms of their sentiment towards both parties? Um, and what do you think are some of the kind of key issues that are playing out um, in the community right now? Well, last week was not a good week for the government. Um, our polling actually shows that the um, the gap uh, the gap moved so that we have labor at fifty five point five to the LNP at 44.5. So a gap of over 10% on that two-party preferred. But I think what we're, what's really important is that we're seeing consumer confidence drop last week, down eight points to 84. And we saw, sorry, that was government confidence, how, how whether people think the country's going the right direction or the wrong direction, down eight points to 84, well below that neutral point. And consumer confidence, was down 5.8 to 90.7. So these indicators that the Australian population are actually not feeling confident about the situation or the future always augurs poorly for the government. And I think if you were to say, what's that all about? Well, it really is all about concerns about inflation, the possibility of interest rates going up. And, um, you know, those are the main things, cost of living. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, might come to you next, Andrew, and particularly, I guess, 
given what Michelle's outlined, you know, what do you think is playing on the mind um, of of the coalition and, and the prime minister um, at this point in time uh, in terms of, you know, those cost of living issues, other issues more broadly? Um, and I guess from a tactical perspective, just where they're, where they're sitting and where you think their focus will be um, in coming weeks. Jared, I think, uh, look, costs of living and its impacts are certainly top of mind uh, with the coalition. It, it's obviously uh, it's something that the coalition is seeking to frame as an economic management issue um, and not, not one where there should be any irresponsible spending. I think where, where we've come, I think it's important to recognise from a March budget. Prior to that, the government was in a poorer position. Uh, some of the perceptions, some of the polling, some of the feedback was much more negative than what it is. The, the budget has been a, a reset. In between, there was a sort of an Easter break, holiday period, and now people are actually having to form a view as to which is the best government to look after the next three years in very trying circumstances globally, economically post-COVID. Uh, and I think on those, on those measures, the government has actually come a long way. Um, I think, um, look, I'm not, notwithstanding, I know um, Michelle just quoted the, the two-party preferred results from her poll, but I think primary votes are a good measure. Um, and I always think they have been, even looking back at the last election. And uh, the coalition has sort of firmed up there. And it's clear people are not altogether happy with the government. I can yeah, obviously be frank about that. But they haven't leapt across to the other side. Yeah, they're, they're looking to either cast a cautious vote or cast a protest vote, but where they go and who they put last and who they put second last is the biggest question right now facing probably both sides of politics. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, Simon, how, how do you see this from, um, you know, in terms of where the focus uh, for, the, for the ALP um, is? Yeah. Well, maybe just taking a little bit of a step back, probably the first thing to note about the current electoral cycle is that we've had three periods in Australian history where the sort of non-major party vote has got over 25%. Uh, one of those was sort of in the 1880s, 1890s, one in the 1930s, and I think we know what happened during those periods. They were born off the back of economic instability and uncertainty. Um, in the uh, uh, At the sort of the turn of the 1900s, of course, we saw the birth of the Australian Labor Party, my side of politics. In the 1930s, we saw the kind of the unity of the conservative side of forces under the banner of the Liberal Party on Andrew's side of politics. And we're back in that situation now. In fact, we have been for the last couple of elections. I think the first thing to say about this election is the most fragmented election I've seen. Uh, I think there are people take a very different view if you're in Western Australia compared to the East Coast about what's happening in this election campaign. Um, if you're in the inner city leafy suburbs, well, we can see with the rise of the Teal candidates and other independents, you know, there's a very informed electorate that's having a, a debate about really big issues like climate change, uh, integrity and the like. But the moment you get out into the suburbs where the election will probably be decided, those sort of outer metropolitan in key regional centre seats, it really is these sort of bread and butter issues that come to the fore and cost of living, as uh, Michelle mentioned, are the absolutely critical issue that's sort of going to define them. If you did a little snapshot today, I think you'd say the Labor Party's got its nose in front and it's got the best chance of anyone of forming a majority government. It's hard at the moment to see how the coalition can win that uh, goat track to majority in their own right. But of course, Scott Morrison is a very clever campaigner and was able to do that in 2019. But in fact, the more likely outcome is we're going to see either close to or maybe even a hung parliament and with maybe a couple of extra independents, largely drawn probably from those teal style candidates um, playing a really key role in the next parliament. All right, Simon. You've certainly you've certainly laid out things um, in a in a bit of detail there. Um, I guess one of the one of the issues that we've seen is you know a lot of people characterising this election campaign as as lacking substance or not focusing on the long term issues. And I think we've seen quite a few of the newspaper editorials sort of focus on this in the in the last week or so. Um, but I guess playing devil's advocate a little bit here. You know, how do we see this in a historical context and, and in light of what the community is most um, focused on? And is that is that a fair or un, unfair characterisation? I might stay with, with you in the first instance, Simon, and, and then go to um, Andrew and Michelle. 
Yeah, well, in fact, if you look at the uh, elections in the past, which have been change of government elections, if you like, um, they've actually tended not to be so much about very big issues. I mean, first of all, obviously, you know, the incumbent government has to be sort of on the nose to a degree, and that's probably the primary precondition to a change of government. But if you go back to uh, 2013, I mean, yes, Tony Abbott was proposing to get rid of the carbon tax and the mining tax, you might recall, but he was also running around saying there were going to be no cuts to health, no cuts to education, no cuts to the ABC, SBS, and those sorts of things. So when you're coming from opposition, you have to do a lot of um, reassurance for voters that, that things aren't going to fundamentally get upended uh, for them. And obviously, in the 2019 election last time around, you saw the Labor Party run with a very big agenda and suffer the political consequences that came with that. But if you go back to uh, the Kevin 07 campaign in 2007, um, Kevin Rudd was really promising Australians a kind of a, a younger, fresher version of uh, John Howard. Um, you might remember he talked about himself as an economic conservative. Yes, there was going to be some progress on some issues like climate change, but it wasn't a very big, uh, big agenda either. Uh, back in 1996, John Howard ran very much a small target strategy in order to get elected. And even if you go back, say, for example, to 1983 with the Hawke government, the big reforms really came after the election, not so much at the election in 1983. So really, other than promising to restore Medicare, which was sort of the key part of that 1983 campaign, there wasn't the same uh, sort of big agenda on the table either. I think you really have to go back to Whitlam's election in 1972 to see a really big agenda put to the Australian people and them ultimately endorsing. Thanks, Simon. A Andrew, do you agree with that sort of uh, characterisation that th there haven't there haven't actually been, when we look through history, um, too many campaigns that have been sort of characterised by by big agendas? Uh, I would to some degree. Um, firstly, I think if I look at say the recent election wins by Labor under Hawke and also by Rudd, um, there was a certain it's time factor, uh, as there were was with Whitlam, but the both Rudd and, uh, and Hawke were seen to have more, more charisma, more, uh, more, more um, empathy with the broader um, the society and, uh, and voters. That's not something that, that, that Labor is actually uh, um, able to claim with Albanese. In fact, probably to some degree the contrary. And I think layer on top of that, um, the fact that, yeah, we are in relatively unique circumstances now. We've, you know, obviously two years of a, a pandemic, the consequences that have flowed from that, which we continue to see flow. A lot of people are facing enormous uncertainty with, 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 their, with their lifestyle, with cost of living, but, yeah, but their work and their future income. Um, there's a whole lot of shifting things. And then layer on top of that, um, yeah, enormous global uncertainty, yeah, which emanates primarily from Russia and from, uh, from China. Under those circumstances, uh, I think a lot of people are, not wanting to add a lot of risk. Um, and I don't think when they look across, even though they may not be completely comfortable with uh, the current government, I think a lot of them can see the government has done a reasonable job in, in trying circumstances. And that when they look to the alternative, it's not as easy as it might have been um, back with Hawke and, and Rudd. So look, I don't think they're readily um, you know, good examples to use to say that they apply today. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Michelle, how do you see this in terms of obviously you're looking at all of the things that, that the electorate cares about? Yeah. Um, and in that context, do you think that, that this election is, as it's been characterised, you know, a bit, a bit of a no substantive issues election? Or do you think it's actually touching on what are the big issues that people Look, are like the about? other Like the others, I don't think elections are the time that you actually have the really big issues playing out. Typically, the big issues are ones that divide the nation. You know, they're things that you, you cannot draw everybody behind you. So they're the sort of things that you engage in on an ongoing basis, like thing, things to do with the environment. You need to grow the momentum and get it into all parts of society, which is happening. But what I find really interesting about this election, you know, the two parties, the two major parties went into this election with the nation essentially distrusting government, politicians, politics, all the government instrumentalities, distrust was extraordinarily high. There was so much conversation about, um, you know, corruption and, and about COVID and the handling of COVID and particularly the distrust associated with the feeling that people hadn't been 
been um, told the truth all the way along. So we entered this with something that feels like a really big issue, trust in government. If we don't trust the government and we don't trust who's leading us, that's a really big issue. And it's been interesting to me to watch that essentially dissipate. And, you know, it's almost like the price of petrol overtook our concerns about honesty in government. And it's really, really interesting. Price of petrol is not the only thing, obviously, that went up. But to find now that the issue that's of greatest importance to the electorate or to the most people in the electorate being cost of living, back to their basic selves, and I don't even want to say self-interest because survival is, you know, the, fund the, the fundamental of self-interest, but with all of these big issues around corruption, honesty, integrity, trust in government that seemed like they would be what this election was fought on, and we've landed back in a discussion about cost of living. Now, the connections are really clear. I mean, you know, COVID um, dramatically changed everything, and now it's playing out in terms of, you know, inflation, in terms of interest rates going up, in terms of shortage of supply, all of these things. But from a people perspective, what they're wanting from the next government is somebody that will protect them from increasing cost of living. Okay, that's a... Really interesting point, and it it hits on um, a question uh, on pigeonhole, which which I'll which I'll come to around trust. Um, and I would just at that point encourage everyone to jump on pigeonhole and and put in some questions. Um, but we do have a, a top question which goes to this question around trust, and I'm I'm going to direct it to Andrew and Simon here, uh, and it comes from uh, anonymous, who's a, a perennial contributor. Um, to pigeonhole, which is fantastic. Uh, and they've asked, what do you think the impact of moments through Scott Morrison's prime ministership, like bushfires, COVID vaccine rollout will be on the election? Is there a level of embedded distrust at this stage? And so what we've clearly heard from Michelle is that that was certainly sitting there um, in, the, in the sentiment and cost of living has kind of overtaken it. Um, perhaps start with you, a Andrew. Um, is, this, is this something that you see still playing out or has it been kind of um, perhaps obscured by other other issues. My, my view on on some of these things, and let me just focus on some of the criticisms of Scott Morrison and uh, yeah, attributing responsibility for yeah many things, bushfires, response, yeah, climate change, flood, drought, pestilence, and so forth. I think it's 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 repeated as a criticism by those people who've already made up their minds as voters, and certainly that might be. More, more Labor leaning and uh, some of the sort of teal soul independence. Uh, the thing I look at is, you know, what, what are the things that are going to influence um, those people who are going to change their vote or who are very softly disposed either way? Um, and, that, and those issues will be different, as, as Simon said um, earlier, and I agree with that, that the, the fringe metro areas, the regions, it, it's very different. So a lot of them hear those criticisms, and, but, but they don't rate them as a, as a significant Issue. In fact, if anything, I think many people, when they consider it in a in a calm fashion, realise that we went through unique circumstances over the past two years. We were building a plane in flight and responding to COVID. Australia has done extremely well compared to other countries. I think most people would concede that. Well, were, could things have been better? Absolutely, but you know we weren't learning from experience apart from the immediate experience we we're in. So, I think if people want to use it as a part of a narrative, I get it. Um, is it going to shift people's vote if they haven't already shifted? I, I don't think so. I think there'll be there'll be bigger issues, which is really, um, and I agree with Michelle and her interpretation of the data. I, I think the cost of living and who's going to actually manage the uncertainty over the next three years is going to be far more dominant in people's decision making. Simon, what do you think in terms of how this will play out? Yeah, look, I, I think trust. Um, I mean, it can be overrated, but I don't think you should ignore it either. Um, if you go back, say, for example, the 2004 election, uh, people might remember that you know, John Howard was under a bit of uh, pressure around uh, some trust and integrity issues, but was able to turn the election campaign with the, you know, that famous slogan, who do you trust, into a campaign about the economic fundamentals that were going on in Australia. The problem I think that Scott Morrison very personally has got is that that issue of trust isn't just about does he tell uh, the truth 
about things. I think you know most people think most politicians are, are a bit loose with the truth. I think I think they think he is more loose with the truth than most. The problem for him is that it connects into things that people actually care about. Um, and it's not just that sense of trust. Is he actually going to be on my side? Is he going to look after me in the years ahead? Um, in that sense, it's also this sense that he doesn't really plan for the future. And that's where it feeds directly into this debate, for example, about cost of living. I'm sure, for example, the people have just received the $250 check from the government like it or bank it and think that's probably not a bad idea. The problem is they know that this stuff is temporary and it's not there to help them with the structural problems that are going on with the economy. The fact that interest rates, you know, whether or not they go up later on this afternoon, next month or in the coming months, they know they're going to rise and that's going to put pressure on people. So that's the problem that he's got. It plays into more fundamental issues about is he really going to be there for me over the next three years when I need him? So I think there is a narrative there that weaves into a wider message about kind of the competence of the government and whether it actually delivers on what it promises to people. And in part, that's what we do at elections. Of course, we vote for the very specific measures that the you know, various political parties put, put up. But we also inevitably install our trust in someone who we think is going to be standing there for the next three years. Are we prepared to listen to them? Do we think that they're actually going to deliver what they say they're going to deliver on, not just in terms of election promises, but in terms of you know, fundamental aspects of government policy. And I think they're the issues that, that the government's got some trouble in, and it's one of the reasons why Labor's absolutely in the game this election. Thanks, Simon. Um, we will move on to, it's certainly coming through and pigeonhole a couple, of, a couple of the specific issues, but perhaps one that's a bit more specific and structural around this cost of living question and where government does play um, a role in terms of housing affordability. Um, uh, anonymous, again, uh, very very good contributor to uh, our questions. Uh, asking about housing affordability and the fact that it does seem to be key in this election, but renters' uh, policies and how will that influence the election and could it benefit the minor parties? Um, I might just, sorry, Simon, to, to make you kind of uh, have to go again, but, but obviously the... ALP has just announced um, a policy uh, around housing. Um, what what do you think around this issue of renters um, sort of being left out? And I guess that's a big issue in terms of cost of living, um, that particular group. Yeah, look, and one of the problems we're going to have with interest rates, you know, going up as they will over the course of the period of time, of course, that will ultimately feed into uh, the rental market and so put pressure, further pressure on the rental market from that point of view. The fact that we've actually, a lot of us have invested money back in our in our homes or buying a second or a third investment property during COVID as well has obviously greatly inflated the housing market and that also will flow through to that rental part of, part of the market. Well, I saw a graph the other day which showed that um, whilst obviously there's been increasing housing stress uh, you know, elevated during this period, there's been a very dramatic upturn in terms of rental stress for people. And, you know, I think we need to have some really honest conversations about the types of cities in particular and regional centres we want to have, how we're going to make housing affordable, quite apart from the package which Labor came out with at, uh, at its policy launch the other day around actually getting people into buying a home. They've got a quite a big policy out there to expand essentially affordable housing. So if you're, you know, if you're living in somewhere like the eastern suburbs of Sydney, if you want to have, you know, the local copper or nurse living in your community, it's almost impossible for them on their wages to be able to buy into those communities. So it's only if government stepping in and investing in both social and affordable housing for that kind of key workforce that you want in your community, uh, they just won't be there. They'll be commuting from a couple of hours away. That's going to become a really big problem in Australia. So there are other policies, as I said, the Labor Party's got out there that will help on that uh, that rental side, but it's, a, you know, it's going to be a broad problem across the communities we go forward. Andrew, this has obviously been, you know, a, a growing issue for a number of um, years now. Um, how do you see it playing into into the election? Do you think it's going to um, bandwidth in the next few weeks? I don't, yeah, I'm going to take a contrary view, and I, I look, I don't think it's going to shift a lot, um, and that's because housing affordability has been an issue increasingly for, let's say, a decade. You've got state governments weighing into it, um, probably in a, a, a more active position to actually shift levers in terms of planning and uh, and 
and home and dwelling approvals and and land land use and land release, and and even they haven't done this uh, well. Um, there's a lot of pushback, uh, whether it's sort of yeah greenfield housing uh, or redevelopment forms of housing, and there, therefore that impacts supply, whereas demand has kept growing. Um, so look, I think there's a lot of governments or states have been delving into this issue. Um, I think the it, it seems to me that. Yeah, Labor's obviously got a policy, but it's a bit unclear as to how it works. The finer detail doesn't seem to be completely mapped out. It hasn't been road tested. So, look, I don't think it's going to, yes, yes, it shows some concern, but I think uh, this has been an issue of some concern for some years. So as a, as a vote changer, as a sort of increasing part of bam, the bandwidth, uh, I don't think it's going to grab a lot. All right, Michelle, I'm keen to understand from your your work, you know, how much um, housing is feeding in perhaps to some of those um, issues around confidence and, you know, the future and, and also cost of living. Is this, as, as we would assume, um, very high in terms of people's um, uh, list of issues here? You're on mute. Thank you for that. Um, housing affordability is an issue and it's been around for a while. I think the critical point is that housing affordability is of extreme importance to those people for whom it's important, those people who actually can't get into a house or are really struggling. They are also the same people who are impacted by unemployment or underemployment or insecure employment or very low paid jobs or they have a couple of kids and they're paying childcare. So it's a really broad issue that is, is one of a bundle of issues that impacts really strongly a group in society. And I don't think that group is one that's going to, um, you know, move this, move this election. Those people were probably not going to vote for the LNP anyway. Um, there's, a, there's a small group of kind of in the middle young families for whom housing affordability, mortgage stress, the cost of um, childcare has only just hit them and they start thinking differently. But for the most part, this is an issue that needs to be resolved. It's, it's a really tricky issue. It's really challenging. In general, everyone would agree that we want housing affordability for all Australians. In practice, whatever policy you put forward, um, half, the, half the mob will hate you and the other half will, will love you. There will be winners and losers when you start messing around with the housing economy. Um, yes, absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. Um, good perspective there. Staying on the, on the issues, um, we've got a question here from Helen. Um, and I was reminded the other day that this was um, a big issue at the 2019 um, election. Um, the widening gap between the wealthiest and those in lowest um, socioeconomic groups um, or inequality, not, not really a major issue as far as I can see um, so far in this in this election. Um, and I guess the question from Helen is, is why? Um, might start with you on that one, um, Simon. Yeah, look, I think the issue is playing out probably a little bit differently this time. I mean, the real focus, if you look at Labor's campaign, is around wages. And so I think for, you know, low to middle income uh, wage earning Australians, there's a very real issue there that they haven't been able to get a pay rise. So rather than the focus, I guess, on those people who are outside of work, Labor's focus very much this time has been on those who uh, are either at sort of that low to middle income scale or in some form of insecure employment, uh, working multiple jobs, for example, uh, and the rights and abilities that they have. I think, to be frank, that's a very traditional Labor sort of campaign issue for Labor to sort of focus on. I think it's a bigger section of the community, to be honest. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a progressive guy. I'd always like to see the Labor Party do more in terms of, uh, you know, social po policy and pensions and those sorts of things. But the reality is when you're running a deficit of, um, you know, $80 billion a year, there's not exactly a lot of money out there for governments to be able to tackle uh, some of these problems. Um, and so I think the party's really just focused its efforts instead of particularly on those low to middle income earners. And when you start looking at where do those people live, will they live in the outer metropolitan suburbs or major regional centres of Australia? All right. Um, Andrew, is this, is this a case perhaps of the economic circumstances that we're in, um, in which, you know, most um, economists and labour market economists like me 
um, are, are talking a lot about the fact that we're actually seeing not just unemployment come down, but underemployment and a whole series of, of mechanisms come down. Um, do you think that's one of the one of the reasons that this isn't playing out as strongly, or do you have another view? I, I think it's going to play out differently in some of those, yeah, the the fringe metro or sort of particularly probably some regional areas um, where yeah, unemployment is not is is not as low as it is um, elsewhere. And I also think under underemployment is a big issue. So there's a lot of people. Uh, you know, I think there's been a and it probably will be increased debate on this. Yeah, people do want to work longer hours or would rather work yeah, two jobs rather than three. Um, I think we're also seeing probably hastened in some respect by, by the COVID couple of years, um, a, a need for people to sort of shift um, in their skills. And I think that's one thing which uh, yeah, the federal government has been mindful of. Um, and in fact, to that degree, to that extent, I think a lot of the state governments have recognised that we need to reskill our workforce. We need to be looking at you know, advanced manufacturing and some other um, yeah, and, and the energy sector. Um, so yeah, some of the jobs that we currently have had in recent decades are going to change and are changing rapidly. So we need to be more adaptable in that regard. So I think that that's where the focus has been from, from a coalition point of view. Um, and I think that's just, they're just unavoidable trends. Um, I think, look, yeah, they're, they're, they're made, they're real, there hasn't been that sort of focus on their sort of, yeah, the, the inequity. Um, but I do think those people who are, who are more vulnerable and, and are more concerned about the future are going to be looking very much at what, what and who is going to help them uh, move and their families into the next decade and beyond. All right. Michelle, any, any insights from um, any of the polling around, around this issue? Um, look, specifically the issue of the gap between the rich and the poor is, is always sitting there, but it's not one that actually shifts votes, um, and I think that's unfortunate. You know, the reality is there are there is a group of people in society that are really struggling, and they have struggled through COVID. They're kind of outside the various safety nets that were brought through, and they have really struggled. For the most part, everyone else did okay. Let's be honest. Spending went through the roof and we're still spending like crazy. That must mean we've got a lot of money. And saving, we saved a whole lot. So on average, we did really well through COVID. And that's due to government stimulus and all of the various things that the government did to make sure that we didn't get into real strife. But there's a group of people who kind of got none of that and they are left behind. So as a nation, we should be worried about them. Um, from a political perspective, is it going to swing the election? I can't really see how it will, and that's why it's not being played out. But I think that, you know, the, the people that would worry most about it are those people who are actually doing, the, the ones who are struggling themselves and the ones who are doing okay, who can actually look and say, well, what about those people? I have moved beyond, you know, cost of living is not an issue for me, but what about all of those other people? And those people's issues of the day are really to do with climate change, gender equity. Those are the things sort of filling up that socially progressive mindset, it seems to me. And can I say, I think this is more important than any of us realise because I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that unemployment's sitting at 4%. It isn't. Roy Morgan asks people whether they've got a job, whether they're working or whether they want more work, and we find almost 8% of the workforce is unemployed and 8.4% or something like that have part-time work and they'd like to be working more. And the vast majority of Australians believe the Roy Morgan figure. So the challenge for us living in the city with all the people who've got jobs and everything's okay is we just don't know what it's like. The people who are unemployed, they must feel sick when they hear the government saying, oh, we've done so well, um, or the opposition. Both parties are exactly the same, talking about unemployment's down to 4%. They must feel so angry because they haven't got a job and they are very strongly supporting non-major parties. This is a big issue, may not play out for this election. It should. It will play out at some point. Sorry, I managed to mute myself, which is um, a very, very good skill for a moderator. Um, you've touched there a little bit on this issue of the fragmentation and, you know, different 
different kind of um, you know issues across different electorates, which sends me into the issue around kind of the battleground seats and and where we should be looking in terms of um, some of the interesting outcomes or the electorates that will decide the um, election on election night. Um, so I would like to get each of your perspectives um, on this. And I might start with you, Andrew. What what are some of the kind of seats that you'll be watching really closely um, on election night that you think could could decide this election? Look, I think in, in, in setting the scene for my answer, um, I think, and I, I think that, along with many, I think there'll be a number of seats, uh, yeah, let's say three, four, in Western Australia, South Australia, where you've got very marginal coalition seats, where you've got incumbents who've retired. Um, very hard to see those not going to Labor. So obviously the, the government needs to win others. And I think the most prospective uh, wins for the coalition are going to be in Victoria and in, in New South Wales. These are sort of fringe metropolitan seats, uh, particularly New South Wales I'd focus on, but also uh, regional. Um, the seats probably like uh, Karangamite in Victoria, Gilmore in New South Wales, which is down the south coast, where you've got a former um, state minister, Andrew Constance, as the candidate. Um, a number of uh, Sydney seats like Parramatta, perhaps even Greenway, I think will be interesting. Um, then if you go up, uh, through the central coast of the Hunter, I think there's, a, there's several seats up there, yeah, Hunter, Shortland and Patterson, all, all of which are, I think, very much in play. I think the, the trend in the campaign so far, if it was to continue, it means those are very prospective seats for the coalition. And, uh, yeah, those would be needed to offset potential losses uh, in South Australia, Western Australia. Some of the outliers, um, Lingiari in the Northern Territory, which is the bulk of the NT, um, and perhaps Lyons in Tasmania, um, where the government already holds two seats. Uh, you know, looking at the state results down there, if they were overlaid, that could be interesting. So it, no question, um, the government can't afford to lose many more seats uh, to those ones in South Australia and WA, but it needs to counter those um, because, you know, frankly, in, in losing more than one or two seats net, which would require it to negotiate with a... So a, 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 an independent in South Australia and uh, Bob Catter in Queensland. Beyond that, the rest of the independents are going to back in a, a Labor Al Albanese government anyway. Um, so, yeah, the coalition doesn't, doesn't have any wriggle room, but they have to win seats, in, particularly in New South Wales. All right. Thank you, um, Andrew. I might, actually, I might actually just ask you one question that's come in on um, Pigeonhole, which is specifically a, a few people have asked about um, Josh Frydenberg and his position in, in Kuyong. What's your reading um, of what's going on there? Look, I, I, I don't get overwhelmed by the, the enthusiasm that gets picked up uh, for the, the Teal independence, and that's uh, where it applies in Ku, Kuyong, Goldstein in, in, uh, in Melbourne. The same goes for Wentworth, North Sydney, and uh, McKellar in, in Sydney. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's always a lot of um, energy around predicting the fall of these seats. Um, that's not to say that there's not some serious competition, but uh, I think uh, a lot of those people who are supporting the Teal independents are basically they're, they're Labor voters who have not got a Labor candidate who's ever run in those seats in recent times seriously. Yes, there are, there are some disgruntled Liberals, but there is basically it's an anti-Liberal groupie Groupie as uh, a group of people, uh, as John Howard has described them, I, I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say relaxed, but I, I think more than likely, I think, I think when all of those independents will not unseat sitting liberals. Um, I'm not going to put that as a as a hundred percent confidence, but I, I don't, I do think a lot of it's been over overhyped and overtalked. Um, the most difficult one for the coalition to win back would be without doubt Warringah. Um, incumbency brings with it a lot of strengths. Um, I think, I think Zali Stegall is going to have a real run for her money. Um, you wouldn't put money on her losing, but I can certainly see the margin reducing. And, and the unique circumstances that played out last time is, which is what the Teal Independents are going to drive um, in all of those seats, is that you know Tony Abbott, yeah, lo love him or like or not, um, yeah, there was a strong sense, very very strong sense. Uh, that he should have not stood last time. And uh, 
I think that played out from a lot of Liberal voters who did a once-off vote against him. Those are unique circumstances which I don't think apply for a, a Kuyong, Goldstein, um, McKellar and some of the other seats. Okay. Um, Simon, what, what, what seats are you um, watching closely? And are, yeah, are there maybe, any unexpected ones in that? Yeah, sure. Maybe just uh, just uh, round off that discussion around this with the teal candidates. Look, I, I don't think at this stage we are necessarily going to see a large number of seats change hands. But I think the way this campaign is going and the type of campaign that Scott Morrison is running, um, which is really almost thumbing his nose at, uh, at those communities, um, I think he's increasing the chances of some of those candidates being successful. Um, and, um, you know, I think, um, you know, if I were to give you a tip today, I think North Sydney, the Liberal Party, is in massive trouble in North Sydney, to be bluntly honest. I think they're in really big trouble in Goldstone as well. I think Josh will probably hang on, um, in part because I think some of those voters will see him as a chance to actually change the Liberal Party. Um, and I do disagree a bit with Andrew on this. I mean, yes, of course, you know, those teal candidates will ultimately get either support or preferences from sort of Labor Green voters. But there is, a, there is definitely a body of very upset former Liberal voters out there that are, that are supporting these candidates. And if you look at the number of volunteers that they're getting in their campaign, these are quite substantive community-based campaigns. In terms of, I guess, the, the seats that I think will actually kind of determine um, who's in government, um, well, there's a pretty good list I can give you at the moment. So if Labor's going to get to sort of 76 or 77 seats, starting as it is on uh, sort of 69, effectively as it is now, it's going to need to at least get a couple of seats out of Western Australia, and we know that there's definitely going to be a swing on there, and the most likely ones are Swan and Pearce. Uh, in South Australia, there's really only one marginal, that's Boothby. Uh, Labor always talks up a big game about trying to win it, um, but never does. Uh, but I actually think in part off the back of um, the very strong campaign that Peter Malinowskis, the new Premier in South Australia, ran, I think Labor's in a red-hot chance uh, this time round. In northern Tasmania, they're the classic marginal seats of um, Bass and Braddon. I think the most interesting feature of that, I, I would have said up until a couple of weeks ago that that was going to be hard going for the Labor Party, but they are getting preferences both from Jackie Lambie and One Nation in those seats. And uh, I think that does mean that Labor's, you know, at least on the, on the, on the park for both of those. Coming up into uh, Victoria, you know, there are the traditional sort of um, marginal seats we've seen over the last couple of elections in Corangamite and Chisholm, and I think you can pretty much toss up a coin about, um, about how they go. I don't think there'll be much gains beyond that. In Queensland, uh, there, I, I don't think there's actually going to be much change uh, up there. I think the only real two seats that are in play there at the moment are the seat of Brisbane, which is kind of a three-way contest between Labor, the Greens, uh, and the current Liberal uh, incumbent, Trevor Evans, and Longman, which has been a bit of a marginal seat, but I think it's still going to be hard for Labor to, to make much progress there. And as Andrew said, New South Wales is kind of really the key. And, of course, he's mentioned the targets that the Liberal Party are, are, are going for. Um, uh, the one that he didn't mention is Reid, which I think uh, the Liberal campaign's in enormous trouble there. They've effectively got a former Liberal member running as an independent against them in that seat. Um, and there's also been a loss of support amongst the Liberal base on the ground uh, in Reid. So I think Labor's got a, got a pretty good chance of picking up uh, Reid along the way as well. All right. Thanks, Simon. Michelle, what's your, what's your research telling you? Look, I think these two probably look at this every day, seat by seat, so they have a very clear view of this seat by seat. Um, our data is showing clearly that the ALP continues to lead in most states, but the LNP's kept its lead in Queensland and Western Australia. So Victoria and New South Wales is where there's been a swing back to the Labor Party. And what we're actually seeing is that that's the area where you have people with mortgages, People with mortgages are more likely to become really unconfident. They've, people with mortgages have dropped 10 points in consumer confidence in a week as a result of concerns about interest rates. So this is a very sensitive issue that could swing um, a large number of seats. I mean, if you, can, if you can lose 10 points in confidence, if you had a 10-point swing, most seats would go. So I think the next few hours, in fact, um, are going to be really important for these people. 
Um, and and the other point to say is that the you know the teal independents, as people call them, in these in these seats where people are relatively affluent, will actually be really important. And I think, for instance, if um, if the prime minister were to make a, a kind of sexist gaffe, that would be have an immediate response in those seats. It's 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 very finely tuned in terms of um, how they view everything that's said. This is a really um, interesting, challenging group, and they're very heightened. That they have a heightened awareness and um, listening carefully. For any for any blunders or any sense that something wrong is being done or said, so I think although there's only a short time to go, and in fact, remember, people can start voting from Monday, and probably some of them will. Um, you know, the the issues are still to play out potentially. The things that could go wrong could still go wrong in the next couple of days or weeks. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Yes, um, eighteen days is a long time. Um, or, a sh- or a very short time, depending on if you're going to cast um, an early vote. Um, we do have a question here, um, uh, a couple of questions, actually, which I'm going to send your way, Simon, um, around the ALP and Albanese. And it's quite funny because um, we've got one person who's saying, have you ever seen a more right-leaning ALP? Um, and another person saying, uh, you know, Albanese is a very safe centrist. But I think both both questions get to the point of um, what would what would they be like in, in government in terms of managing um, some of the different different sort of positions um, in the in the party. Um, so interested in in your perspective on that, um, Simon. In terms of um, I guess where you see um, this group in terms of that that kind of um, pendulum and and how the different sort of um, factions would be would be managed if uh, they were to form government. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, you know, um, Albo is uh, is an old lefty, and all of you have probably seen the hot Albo photos from his time back as a, you know, a bit of a red ragger back at university and those sorts of things. But if you look at his record as a minister in government, for example, during the Hard Gillard, uh, you know, uh, Rudd Gillard years, um, he he was a very centrist uh, minister. He was very collaborative in his style, working both with you know industries, labour, and community sectors. He had a very strong focus on local government and partnerships with them as well, and I think that's very much his style. I mean, in one sense, you know, I think he's a he's a very um, you know collaborative style of person in terms of the way that he works with inside his shadow ministry. I think people obviously had COVID last week, and you got a bit of a sense of what the rest of the Labor team uh, looks like as well. Um, uh, and you know, a good example of this is that one of the first things that Labor is going to do if it's elected is hold a job, job summit and basically bring everyone together to actually tackle some of the issues that Michelle was talking a little while ago about that sense of how are we going to create you know the job and training opportunities of the future for those able to take advantage of it, mm-hmm. but how do we also put a greater safety net under people so that they feel more secure, those people at the fringes of the workforce, if you like, have got more certainty in their lives and more able to reach up the economic ladder uh, that comes with that. So I think that's the type of Prime Minister that uh, that he'll be. Um, look, you know, he's, he's certainly not a Bob Hawke, you know, when it comes to popularity stakes, but if you want to think about a style of leadership, someone who's very much, you know, works with his colleagues, is very collaborative in terms of um, style, that's the type of Prime Minister I think you'll get. Thanks, uh, thanks, Simon. We've got about five minutes um, to run before we close. And, and on that basis, I want to absolutely make sure that we have time for final predictions um, to make sure that you can elaborate as much as possible in terms of what's going to happen um, over the next few weeks and on um, election election day. And perhaps interested in, in that as well on any perspectives on something that you think, um, uh, you know, more unexpected or, or things that might kind of come out of the woodwork. We do have a question on, on pigeonhole around um, most unexpected commitments we've seen so far in the election campaign. Um, perhaps, um, Andrew, because you're laughing, I can I can start with you um, in terms of just, you know, how do you think the next few weeks are going to uh, play out and, and, and what we might see on um, election night? But if I go... First, I'll have a right of reply. Um, oh. <laughs> um, look, I, 
Well, tr- there's a bit of optimism in this, naturally enough, because I think the coalition is is coming from behind. I think the gap has been closed. Um, it, it's got to close an awful long way, and there's there's an awful lot of planets that need to align very neatly. Um, I do think it's possible, but I, if I'm going to put a percentage on it, I think it's a sort of 55, 45 percentage uh, likelihood as of today. But I think it 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 will close. What could shift that? I don't think there's going to be any extraordinary. Um, policy pronouncements that are going to actually shift sentiment massively. I think, um, yeah, a mistake by either leader um, could be enough to reinforce prior mistakes. Um, yeah, I, I would love to see a bit more scrutiny of, uh, of the opposition leader on, on matters economic um, and repeat day one, but I, I think that's probably not going to happen. Um, I think the, the, the COVID respite was probably helpful for him. Um, look, I think uh, yeah, there, there will be there will be seats lost by the coalition, and unless the the the, the trend t- continues towards the coalition, there won't be enough seats to pick up um, for them to sort of offset the losses. Um, so, yeah, look, I, a minority government I think is currently um, prospective, um, but I yeah I, I I'd never say never until it's over. Um, Scott Morrison has always campaigned very well. I do think there is a lot of people, notwithstanding all the different polling techniques, who uh, who remain either undecided um, or are not responding to uh, to pollsters, or are softly disposed, who may just shift depending on what ultimately resonates most powerfully for them and in the in the seats that count, and they're the ones that we've we've basically covered. And I I can see those sort of national international economic issues coming more to the top of the mind of people regardless of who they vote for first it's it's who they who they vote for in sequence in that full preference ballot they've got to decide whether they put labor or liberal ahead or behind each other um so i i still see a re- very real prospect of uh, the government holding on um but i think the yeah, the odds are slightly more so that there'll be a change Must not use the mute button anymore. Um, all right, si- Simon. Um, you know, pretty pretty interesting perspective there from from Andrew. How are you seeing things? Yeah, look, and I don't sort of fundamentally disagree with that sort of analysis in the sense that um, you know, if the government genuinely can engage people, uh, you know, around its strengths or perceived strengths around the economy and national security. Um, then it can do so. I think it's struggled to do so so far during this campaign, and obviously, the, you know, the inflation number last week, and if we see an interest rate rise later on today, um, you know, whilst some might say that's great, you're talking about the economy, you're not talking about the economy in a good way. You're talking about people who are getting increasingly worried about their economic prospects. And I think one of the interesting little um, tensions in that is that when people feel you know more optimistic they're quite happy to have the government sort of uh, you know off their backs and have more freedom and they're more likely to vote for the coalition but the more they become uncertain the more that they think that there there is risk out there they actually retreat to the Labor Party because it's, it's that's what governments do don't they they actually help you out when you're in trouble so um, I think that you know, this change of mood over the next couple of weeks is going to be very significant. We certainly can't rule out some kind of an external event. I mean, what if, for example, you know, Chinese military police or something turn up in the Solomon Islands in the next couple of weeks? You know, I think that will cause a lot of fear and concern within the Australian community about, you know, where our national security situation is now. Of course, I hope that doesn't happen. But these are the types of events that literally can change the political dynamic on a dial. But if we look at where the campaign is heading at the moment, the simple reality is is that, yeah, I think Andrew's right, the coalition are on track certainly to lose some seats, not to gain enough back on the other side. But I think the bigger question, if you would ask that today, is can Labor you know, grind out enough seats to get into a majority in its own right? But a small minority government on the Labor side is quite possible, for, I think, from where we're sitting today. As I said, it's just a lot harder to to count the number of seats the coalition need to keep themselves in firm majority government. All right, thanks, Simon. So, Michelle, so far, no, no clear result expressed um, other than, than <laughs> minority government or hung parliament. Um, what, what's your what's your prediction? 
Look, if you go by our data on a two-party preferred basis, the ALPs 55.5, the LNPs 44.5. That's a huge gap in only a few weeks to close. And we've seen this third week of the election, what looked like the LNP starting to catch up has actually turned again and has got worse for them. So perhaps the best, it's, it's really unlikely that the LNP can actually come back from this. Um, the best result they can probably hope for at this stage would be a hung parliament and an ALP minority government. Um, as I said, with early voting starting uh, on Monday, there really isn't a lot of time. Um, there probably isn't a lot of time for an invasion from China or Mars either. But what there is still plenty of time for is one or other of the leaders to make a gap. So that, for instance, if Albanese were to have another slip, which made people think that he really didn't get the economy, that would be very, very problematic. But let me just leave you with the reminder that every election we've surveyed after the event, 22% of the people who voted tell us that they made up their mind in the polling booth. Is that not a horrific thought? Um, but it tells us it can go either way. Thanks, Michelle. And, and maybe whether they've had their democracy sausage on the way in or whether they're getting it on the way out may affect their sentiment um, while they're sitting in that polling booth um, as well. well all you sorts know, the of thing is we all, we all look so closely at these things. We look seat by seat, issue by issue. We approach it logically, rationally, emotionally. And then people who are really busy, busy leading their lives and worrying about normal stuff, line up to vote. And one of the most horrific things I saw was a mum saying to their child, and who do you think we should vote for? So um, we have to recognise that this is not for everyone as important and well thought through as it is for us. Thanks, Michelle. We might um, we might end on that note. Um, and I re would really like to thank um, our speakers today, Simon, Andrew and Michelle, um, for making the time for this discussion and um, for really um, offering uh, your candid insights uh, and, and expertise. Um, jump into Pigeonhole if you haven't already. Even now, you can still jump in there uh, and you will see the results of our poll. Um, and in terms of the most pressing issue the next Parliament face, um, you were very clear in saying that that would be the transition uh, to net zero. Um, so, but um, as Michelle says, not everyone um, approaches every uh, issue in a federal election um, so rationally. Um, so, who knows what the what the broader perspectives are? But that is very clearly our audience's um, perspective in terms of the most important issue. Um, I'd also like to thank um, everyone who's tuned in today and obviously um, everyone who's put in um, a question. Uh, all of this has been recorded and, and will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, so if you have colleagues or others who you think would be interested, um, please make sure that you pass on uh, the link. Um, and as always, please jump on CEDA's website, cedar.com.au, to um, keep abreast of what we're doing. Um, and in particular, a couple of upcoming live streams that might be uh, of interest. Uh, on May the 31st, we have our first forum for the ESG community, uh, where we'll be exploring challenges and opportunities for um, ESG practitioners. Um, and on the 6th uh, of um, May, as we lead into the I think that's actually meant to be June the 6th, uh, as we lead into our 2022 State of the Nation conference, um, we'll be looking at Australia's climate choices um, and the, the what and the why um, and looking at, looking at that. So please um, jump in and get into those um, conferences. Uh, in the meantime, um, thanks again for joining us today and uh, please enjoy the rest of your uh, day. Thank you very much. <laughs>